The application period for Chevalier Awards are usually August to November each year, and applications are currently open. And I encourage um, persons who are on this call, as well as if you know any of your colleagues who may be interested in studying in the UK or doing a master's to apply. The scholarship usually lasts for a year, and the fellowships, um, which is what I went on, last three months to a year. So why did I apply for the Chevenin Fellowship? And by virtue, why should you apply? Here are some, some reasons why you should apply, or why I apply that I'm sharing. So the two main reasons were for professional and personal development. On the professional side, I wanted to build on my special collections experience. I wanted to foster networking opportunities. Um, the title of my presentation is Building Bridges, and that was one of the main ways, or is one of the main ways through which you can build um, bridges and, and build relationships is through networking. And I wanted to experience what it was like working at the British Library, which in Library World is one of the top libraries in the world. On the personal side, I wanted to experience living in the UK. The UK is a very diverse country, London in particular, where I was living for the year. Very, very diverse city. I wanted to experience different cultures and meet new people. Throughout the year, um, as Tracy mentioned in the introduction, I worked with the, the two departments at the British Library, namely Echo Center for American Studies and the Endangered Archives Program. The Echo Center, I'm just going to talk a little bit about each department, um, is responsible for promoting the study of the British Library's America's collections to include North America and more recently, Caribbean. They also work on bibliographic guides. I was privy to work on, a, I was well, part of my project, uh, one of my main projects was working on a bibliography of non-book Latin American sources before 1950, which we're hoping to make available to researchers by year end. They also facilitate lectures, exhibitions, and interviews. The Echo Center, one of the, you know, there are many wonderful things about the center, but one of the things that I particularly like is that they offer fellowships and and one such fellowship I'm going to mention here is the Visiting Fellowship. Um, applications are currently open and I encourage persons to apply. These fellowships are given to researchers, um, masters level, PhD level, or just general independent researchers to come to the British Library for usually a one month period because of COVID. Of course, things are more remote and they're, you know, they're flexible and they give up to 2,000 pounds for you to come and use the Latin America, more so the Caribbean and North American collections to help with a current research that you're doing or to just do more research on a specific topic that has not been explored before. The Endangered Archives Program, or EAP for short, facilitates the digitization of archives around the world that are in danger of destruction, neglect, and physical deterioration. And the bulk of my research was with EAP. Um, they provide grants, pilot, major area, and rapid response are the four main grants that they give. Each of them cover different scope. Pilot grants are usually up to 60,000 pounds, major, a little bit more, area grants up to 150,000 pounds. Rapid response is the newest grant that they're offering where you get 10,000 pounds to salvage an archive that is in, you know, immediate, immediate, you know, as in the materials are in dire need of repair. AAP also offers access through its online catalog, which has over 8 million images and 2,500 audiovisual materials freely accessible from anywhere in the world. And I encourage, you know, we're information professionals because of COVID, a lot of our public spaces are closed. This is a great resource that researchers can tap into as well as librarians, depending on your research focus, to use and get a lot of useful information, not just about um, the Caribbean regions. There are a few projects from the Caribbean, but just countries all over the world. EAP also supports research. I am a recipient of that. As I mentioned, my main research focus throughout the year was working with EAP and I did research on digitized archives from Latin America and the Caribbean and I'm going to be sharing some of the findings from my research 
throughout the year. At the beginning of my research, my main aims um, were to identify black countries where EAPDX had been undertaken from throughout the period 2004 to 2019. I wanted to examine the scope of each project undertaken. I looked at the subject, the language, and the time span of materials. I also wanted to get an idea of the percentage of materials which were related to ecclesiastical and the transatlantic slave trade slash slavery. Ecclesiastical um, refers to church records. So I wanted to know what percentage of the projects focused on that. I also sought to find out how past project holders, persons who would have received EAP grants in the past or organizations were engaging the audience or engaging the public or users with the information or the communities that they serve with the, with the information that would have been digitized. And I also wanted to find out how researchers or current researchers could also engage with the material. And I have, throughout my research and even now, work to increase the accessibility of um, resources. And when I say lack, I'm referring to Latin America and the Caribbean, um, EAP materials to everyone. So some of the main findings that I got from my research were that there was a total of 27 lack countries which would have applied for EAP grants throughout the period, 13 from the Caribbean and 14 from Latin America. Of those 27 countries, there were 139 project applications in total. 110 from Latin America and 29 from the Caribbean. And based on this analysis, we can see clearly that the, there's a disproportion in terms of applications from Latin America as opposed to the Caribbean region. And that is one of the reasons why um, my fellowship was created because they had an idea, but you know, they didn't really have the data to support, to substantiate that they weren't getting as much applications from the Caribbean and I'm hoping to bridge those type of gaps, you know, with persons who work in information center to, you know, take advantage of these sort of, you know, monetary um, opportunities to help our centers to digitize the information that we have so that persons can have more access. So throughout my research or at the end of, or towards the end of my research, I used um, data Visualize, a data visualization tool to help me with my analysis. The specific data visualization tool that I use is called Tabulu. It's a free online resource. There's also Power BI um, if you're using the Microsoft suites of resources that you can use. And data visualization tools basically just help you to have a picture or, or display the information in such a way where it makes it easier to analyze. And certainly it is more visually appealing. This is a data that data visualization of Jamaica. We've had one EAP project um, throughout the period and they're hoping, well, I'm hoping that, you know, with my advocacy and sharing about EAP that this number will increase. And this just shows the, the, country, the country, the EAP number and the status of that specific project that was undertaken. Using the same data visualization tool, Tabulu, I was also um, able to display the year of application. This specific display shows the year of application um, from different Latin American countries in different years, from the period 2004 to 2010. And I used um, Tabulu to visualize other aspects of my research, but time won't allow me to share that in depth, but I'm just sharing these two examples. I also looked on the scope of each project, or the different projects that were undertaken. I categorized them in different subjects, um, narrowing it down to documents, newspapers, images, audiovisual materials, and inventory. And then there were they, these were just broader headings for the, as you can see in brackets, different resources that were digitized. So documents would refer to manuscripts, records. So instead of listing that out each time, just to make the, da the data a bit more manageable and kind of compressed, I use general terms to talk about these specific items. I found that the main languages of materials um, were English, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, and French. And the time span for most of the Latin American materials that were digitized 
are between 1500 to 2000, which is very wide. You can get a lot of information during that time period if you're doing research or if you have or you know of persons who are doing that sort of research. I found also that 21% of the records were related to the church or were stored by the church or related to the church in general or religion. And another 22% related to the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. In terms of research and engagement, most past project holders and researchers were engaging with the materials by producing blogs, writing about their projects that they would have undertaken and talking about how their projects impacted the communities that they carry them out in. For example, this specific blog post um, was done by one of our past project holders from Barbados. She um, was actively involved in the digitization of the Barbados Mercury, which is a 18th century um, Barbadian newspaper. Um, and it featured a lot of runaway slave ads. And I'll speak more to that on how they have also, I've also I partnered with them to host workshops to teach persons how to use these digital resources in creative, creative ways. Another blog post from one of our past project holders in, from Argentina. This one is called a survey of archival material in small Jewish communities in the rural era of Argentina. And he basically just talks about how the project impacted that specific community um, and how the information is import was important or is important to the cultural heritage of that specific community. Very, very nice blog post. Um, at the end, I'll share how you can get access or maybe view some of these posts. I also found that past um, project holders were very active on Twitter, some, of course. Um, I mentioned, we, I use the EAP Twitter analytics data to find the top mention or, or find the two or five project holders who were hosting a lot. Here we have Natasha Lightfoot. She was a past project holder on a project in Antigua and Barbuda. And Amala Levi, she also worked on, or she's a past project holder from the Barbados Mercury EAP project. And you can see they're very active, their engagement 308, 929 throughout the one year period. I am also, I also sought, and I'm, I'm still continuing with this aspect of my research is to increase accessibility to the digitized resources that the Endangered Archives programs produce. I worked um, collaboratively with the Barbados Archives for the period of May to just you know September, where we explored ways to engage creatively with the runaway slave ads, and we engage members of just regular persons in Barbados, um, show them how they could access the runaway slave ads. Some persons, we showed them how they could use it in genealogical research. We showed them how they could use it in speculative writing, creative writing. And I'm hoping that at some point I can um, use some of NLJ's special collections items to have a similar project where we can engage users using the materials that we have in different and more creative ways. From the workshop, other opportunities came by this time COVID was taking place. And so a lot of um, engagements that I did were, um, moved online. Um, before COVID, I did a British Library, I did a presentation with the British Library um, at the British Library Doctoral Open Day. I, in, in terms of virtually, I did a presentation with the Cornell University Library. I did creative workshops with um, the Barbados Archives, and I presented to BBC staff group, to a, a group of BBC staff members who are of West Indian heritage. And here I screenshotted my first virtual presentation. I don't know if you can meet me out here in the middle that I did with. Cornell, which was a really, really good, was my first virtual presentation and it was it went really well. In terms of promotion throughout the year, I was reimagining, there was a, a, a Twitter handle called EAP Revisited and they, I was asked to contribute to this. I used the hashtag Achievement Choice and I selected materials, past projects that we, EAP would have worked on and promoted. Um, to, to, you know, to bring kind of, you know, bring back focus to these projects, get persons aware that these resources exist, especially in COVID, again, remote access and accessing materials remotely, very, very important. And of course, um, my bibliographic guide, which hopefully will be published by the end of the year, 
was created to help researchers who want to know what the British Library has on Latin American sources or Latin American collections to have a better understanding of what is available to them. And of course, throughout the year, I had a few challenges. For the most part, things were mostly good, but COVID happened and that completely changed the trajectory of my fellowship. Everything had to go online. I had to um, adapt um, to remote access. And of course, in terms of challenges, there was the British weather, winter and rain. I do not miss those at all. I am glad to be back in my sunshine the weather is not nice at all in terms of my experience living in the uk professionally working at the british library my knowledge of library collections and systems have improved in terms of i had opportunities for training in excel project management power bi as i mentioned before data visualization to very good very useful tools to help me in my everyday tasks even back at nlg I've had great opportunities, uh, lovely um, meetings in terms of staff talks at the British Library, meeting different staff members working in different areas of the library, attending coffee mornings hosted by the Eccles Center, which is their way of engaging with current researchers or potential researchers of the Americas collection. And one of the contributions that I'm most proud of is my contribution to the BAME network. And BAME is, it stands for Black Ethnic Minority Ethnicities. It's basically the minority groups, or minority groups, or the, the terminology for minority groups in the UK. And the British Library has a chapter, and they asked me to talk about how I felt. So at the, at the front of the British Library, there are four big busts of the founders or the founding fathers. And one of the founding fathers is Sir Hans Sloan. And Hans Sloan, those of us who are from NLG know that we have um, resources on from Hans Sloan that he would have um, collected while he was here. He was married to a past um, plantation owner and he came here, he was a doctor. And you know, he wrote a lot of things. But you know, in the context and in the environment of, you know, there's COVID and there was a Black Lives Matter movement. There's been a lot, of, lot more consciousness about, you know, these sort of monuments that we have in our public spaces. And so they asked me to write about how it made me feel as a librarian at the British Library and also as a Black person in England working at a library that has um, someone like this as his founding father, knowing the history behind it. And so I was very happy to contribute to that. And this bus or this um, document is going to be placed at the front of the library. I think it is there now and will be there for a very long time. So that was definitely a highlight. I benefited also from immense mentorship opportunities. This is an image of me in the office before COVID. This is me in my home office that I created in my room. Um, mentorship definitely helped me in terms of adapting and, you know, just helping my perspective um, in terms of remote working. I had the great opportunity of working with two of the best teams. Here's a picture of me with my Echo, with my EAP team members, and here's a picture of me with my Echoes team. And we had an outdoor picnic for me when I was, well, they had a organized an outdoor picnic when I was about to end my fellowship. Personally, living in the UK, I had the experience, experience in the culture. I got to visit the Manchester United Stadium. I don't know if there are any Man U fans. But that was really excited for me. Um, that is my team. I went to theaters, um, museums, and of course, I couldn't leave England and not take a picture beside the red telephone booth. That is a must. In terms of places, I mentioned I visited museums. This is me in front of the British Museum, and this is me at um, one of the Tate Modern Museums in front of an exhibition called the British Library, which is just absolutely beautiful. And here I am on the Tower Bridge. We Jamaicans call it the London Bridge. It's not the London Bridge. The London Bridge is something completely different. This is called the Tower Bridge, which I learned while I was there. And most importantly, and most um, memorable is the experiences I had that I met, both um, from my college and also the vast um, leaders from all over the world 
um, through the Shivening Network. This is me. This is us at the Shivening Orientation. Um, person from the Jamaican contingent as well as the Latin, the Latin American region. This is a photo of all of us right there. So now my fellowship has ended and next steps, what next? So currently I'm working on a detailed report of my research findings, which I'm hoping to present um, two papers, one at the Caribbean Studies Conference. I'm not sure if, I'm thinking it will be mostly virtual, um, so I'm preparing for that. I'm also looking to submit a paper to the BL repository. Last week I saw a call for papers from the Viaja Journal. I'm considering that, I'm not promising, um, but I'm also considering doing a paper for that to just share some of my findings and my experience. I'm looking and I'm, well, I'm currently having research partnerships with fellows from, mainly from the Echo Center who are researching the Caribbean collections and I'm giving support there with my collections knowledge. And I'm also open to work with, working with any other Caribbean studies researchers. Um, you, some of you are on this call, if you know anyone who is interested in that specific area of research, I'm open to sharing my knowledge on that. I'm also contributing, or I have contributed a blog post. I did a blog post for the BL Mac section, where I talked about the K-Top collection, which is short for the King's um, Topographical Collection at the British Library. It's the extensive collection of items collected um, by King George. And they have digitized all the maps from the collection. A lot of Jamaican maps, even some um, from that we have in special collections. I mentioned that in my blog post. I'll share the link to that um, after the presentation. So you can maybe go ahead, have a read and see what is there. In terms of, I'm hoping to do workshops with NLC members to share um, some of the new skill sets that I've learned. Um, I'm also open to do presentations with the library community as I'm doing one now. Um, I'm looking to doing a Jamaica study day, which is a talk that I'll be doing with the Echo Center, which was supposed to be held in March, but because of COVID, it has to be rescheduled and I'm hoping to do that by year end. And my most, I would say, eagerly, our, the one I'm anticipating the most, is partnering with a regional or local body to host an Eccles Center funded conference. So Eccles Center is willing to put up funding to engage um, researchers in the Caribbean to know more about the Eccles Center. They are looking to branch out more into the Caribbean. As I mentioned before, their main focus was North America, but they're looking to engage the Caribbean more. And I am that bridge um, to spread the word, to share about the resources that they have, um, and they have a lot of money that they want to share, really. So I am looking forward to, I'm open, I have one particular regional body in mind, but I'm open to any other regional body or association or if your institution wants to partner with me to help this conference come to life. And I am promoting the Chevenin brand. I was a lot here, but I'm a Chevenin for life, and I'm grateful to the Chevening Secretariat for the opportunity that they have afforded me. Um, I've learned so much and I am forever grateful. Thank you so much for your time. This is my contact details. Feel free to send me an email. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Reach out. I am willing to share with anyone. If you have any questions, I am open as well. Thank you so very much. Chantal, just a minute before you go into your question and answer session, I would just like to take the time out to welcome Mr. David Drizzle, the Colinet Coordinator Representative, and Dr. Paulette Carr from the University of the West Indies Main Library, so the President of Library and Information Association of Jamaica, Mr. Mark Jeffrey Dean. Any questions for Chantal? I'm looking in the chat and I see a question from Sheree Roden. She says, what's the email address? Um, which email address? My personal email address or one of the departments I mentioned? 
of mine. So I'm going to type my email address in the chat. It's chantel.richardson at nlj.gov.jm. Also, to interject, while Chantel is typing her email address, we want to thank you all for attending as well and look out for the different activities for Library and Information Week that is happening this week. And we have coming up our Leaja president to talk more about that. We also have the UNESCO webinar tomorrow. The link is being shared or will be shared shortly. And also we have the NLJ Writer Workshop on Thursday and that link is also being shared. So the floor is now open for your question. Any questions, comments, queries, concerns? Paulette Carr from UA, Mona. Chantel, thanks so much for that very, very informative um, presentation. I'm so proud of you. Um, it's, it's very good. So I wanted to find out in terms of the research agenda that you had, was was it part of your application? I mean, did you say to them this is what you wanted to do, or is it when you got there, um, you started to do that um, survey? I just wanted to I just want to understand how you shaped the research agenda that you had. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Carr, for your kind words and your question. So, in terms of the research agenda, um, the fellowships are, are usually very um comprehensive so they have a specific theme or topic that they want you to focus on so my theme was research on digitized archives from Latin America so be even before I applied I was aware of the area of research that I would have to go and focus on in terms of my research plan when I arrived at the British Library my supervisors asked my input in terms of how or how I would shape the research some other data or research questions or investigations or things that I would want to know more about. So there was a over, there was a clear theme before I applied. Under the leadership of Ms. Lashley our national librarian for hosting this well-received and insightful event. And I must thank you, Chantel, as well, for delivering a presentation in a meaningful and real way. I mean, you gave us information from your own lived experience and a glimpse into your own journey. I, I'm impressed. And I'm impressed with the fact that you mentioned as well that you'll be sharing your this new knowledge with your organization, really giving back. So thank you so much, um, Chantel. I also, I do hope other persons within the profession would have been so inspired to apply for the scholarship and take a similar journey, um, really creating their own story. Um, on behalf of the, and so on behalf of the Library and Information Association of Jamaica, I am truly humbled by the depth and reach of the National Library in ensuring that this Library and Information Week is supported and sufficiently represented by the organization. Uh, to tell the truth, I, I made, I, earlier I made careful note of the theme of Chantel's presentation, and, and that was because it highlighted a critical component of information ethics, which we shouldn't overlook at all. Um, the theme says in, yeah, using information and in building bridges, not walls. In other words, uh, giving serious thought to academic progression within the profession. Um, truly, as a catalyst for closer cooperation, uh, presentations such as these um, inspires us to, uh, to, to, to move upward within the profession, to, to, to look highly at the profession itself. Liaja wishes the National Library of Jamaica a successful and fulsome week of activities and look forward with enthusiasm to the proceedings of um, the upcoming uh, workshops. Now, just to, to give um, uh, those who are listening a, a preview of the other activities we have coming up for the week. And, and mind you, we had a wonderful church service yesterday at the Victory Family Center. I want to thank Pastor Ling and um, Dr. Gardner Baker for, for hosting us. It was really wonderful. Uh, on Tuesday, that is uh, tomorrow, we'll be having the UNESCO Virtual Memory of the World Forum for Caribbean Member States. 
And that, that's a collaborative effort between JARD, NLJ, PIOJ, endorsed by, by LIAGE, and that begins at 11 to 1 p.m. On Wednesday, we have um, the Office of Utilities Regulation Symposium, um, and they are really unlocking their resource center and inviting us to experience that with them as well. And then Thursday, we have the LIAGE uh, Gleaner Supplement publication coming out. On Friday, the DLIS will be hosting um, its, its students, so to speak, in uh, in a seminar that looks at misinformation during and uh, during this um, pandemic period. The Jamaica Library Service as well has a number of activities happening throughout the week um, from their parish libraries. And so I what I will do again is to ask that the that this be sent out so that all members of Liaja uh, are aware of the activities and they will be so enticed to attend. So once again, I thank you very much uh, for the platform to, to say a few words, uh, Ms. Ricketts and Chantel. I am looking forward to greater things happening. You have already uh, done wonderfully great things. I'm looking forward to greater things happening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Deans. Uh, Ms. Ricketts, as chair, if I may, I'll call it Tara again. Yes, Dr. Carr. Hello. Hello. Yeah, just to say that um, the Mona Library, the UA Mona Library, is also celebrating, participating in Library Week as we have our open week this week. And we have a number of events that just this morning we launched the, um, the week and the celebration of books exhibition. And throughout the week, we have a number of um, a number of events. I'm going to ask um, Miss Bourne to send out um, to Liage. I know I've seen a few of them coming out, but just to send out the entire listing and they're all open to the to Liage and the LIS community. So we have op we are celebrating Open Week this week as part of um, Library Week and. Um, we used to have it earlier, but we've decided to have it during this week with Library Week. So um, we will send out a listing of the events that we are having. OK. OK, thank you, Dr. Carr. You can just send it and we'll share along and okay. join in with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, I just want to share that Shevening Awards, the application is currently open for both fellowships and scholarships. And I encourage persons who are on the call who may be interested in doing in a master's in the UK to apply. If you have any questions regarding the application process, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to share any information or answer any other questions as best as I possibly can. So applications are currently being accepted for the period next year, that's 21, 2022. And I'm encouraging persons to apply, or if you know of persons who may be interested in applying, feel free to share with them. And if you have any questions, no matter how small, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to assist in that regard. Thank you, Chantal. And now we'll just have Miss Cousins to give a brief vote of thanks. Good afternoon, colleagues. Mr. Mark Jeffrey Deans, President of the Library and Information Association of Jamaica. Ms. Beverly Lashley, CEO, National Librarian, and my fellow colleagues. It is with honor that I accepted to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the National Library of Jamaica on this occasion of the webinar. First, I wish to thank my colleague, Ms. Chantel Richardson, for being brave enough to build a bridge that has taken her on a path which she has taken time out to share with us to the organizing committee of the Library and Information Association of Jamaica for this time in celebration of Library and Information Week 2020. Thank you is also extended to the National Library of Jamaica for championing this webinar session, which has given us an insight on archives and archiving from a different perspective. Finally, to our participants, who have taken the time out to join us uh, for this webinar. We greatly appreciate your participation. 
I am sure that after today, we will only be building bridges that will lead to the success of ourselves and the library and information profession in Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you, Chantal, 